Firstly, so uh, we are going to be starting with the past questions on biology, breaking down the past question, everything. What do you think? Do you think it's so much challenging, especially those people that are preparing for UTMB? I am holding yours. Just try to pay a maximum attention to it and listen. If you have any questions, you can just jot down your questions. And I am very, very sure that with the help of God and the knowledge of God, we will be able to answer your question. So I would like to invite Mr. Salman to take over. Thank you very much. So Mr. Salman, you can just start. Thank you very much, sir. Good day, everybody, and I welcome us to this class today. Uh, my name is Salman Onide. I'm the biology tutor for Sci Africa. We'll be having our, our jump um, questions, revision, and explanations this uh, afternoon. I will be sharing my screen for all of you to see so that we can begin. So let's start. Can we all see my screen? Uh, we can, I th we, I'm just seeing your picture. I think maybe you can just open the, where we have the applications or the, yeah. Yes, I can see it now, yes. Visible, okay, thank you very much. So we'll be treating um, jumpers questions on biology. I will be explaining to us, and I want us to also jot down our questions if you have any one. Then after the class, we will now begin to to ask the questions. So you the first question it. I have here. We can see again. Okay, now, yes, we can. I can see now. Okay, fine. Yeah, if, if at any point you can't see my screen, please call my attention so I can, I can share my screen again. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So the first question I have here is, which of the following has the most primitive respiratory system? Talking about primitiveness. There are two things we need to understand in um, in evolution. We have primitiveness and we have advancements. Advancement has to do with has to has to do with something being complex, having complex structures and complex functions. But primitiveness has to do with something that is old, old school or something that is out of date, that is no longer in vogue. That that that's what we call primitiveness. So we have four 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 options here. Which of the following? has the most primitive respiratory system. Human beings use lungs for respiration. Other, in, other organisms, have, they also have different organs for, for, for respiration. But among all these we'll have, which one has the most primitive respiratory system that is no longer in folk? The first one is insects. The second one is fish. The third is snail. And the, and the, and the fourth one is mouse. Out of these organisms, we're going to classify them based on evolution. The most advanced among them would be the one that has what a backbone that's a vertebrate we we'll have we have a vertebrate we have two vertebrates among them and we have two invertebrates so talking about primitiveness it we, we, we have to look towards the, the invertebrates because those animals that have bones or that have backbones they are more advanced than those that don't have backbones so in that case mouse and fish are both advanced so they are not primitive so they shouldn't have primitive or respiratory system so the answer now lies between insects and, and snail. Insects are, are members of the, of the um, phylum Arthropoda, while snails are member of phylum Mollusca. Now talking about these two, we have insects being having more primitive or respiratory system compared to snails. So the answer here is what is insects. The answer is option A. So shall we go on? Number two, one adaptation shown by hydrophytes in freshwater habitats is what? What are hydrophytes? Hydrophytes are organisms, they're actually plants, plants that, that live in, that we, found, or we, can found in, we can find or that are found in the aquatic environment. They are called hydro, hydrophytes. Hydro there means water. Phyte means plants. So water plants, are plants that are found inside water. What are, what are those adaptive features that they have? that make them survive in that environment. Number one, 
waxy cuticle on shoot surface. B, poor development of roots and xylem tissues. C, well developed roots and supporting system. And the D part is saying leaves reduced to spines. So which one is the answer among these options? So since these plants are, are water plants, they are plants that live in water. Hydro means water, fight means what plants. So in that case, the children have waxy cuticle. Waxy cuticle helps to, helps to prevent plants from desiccation, from no. losing water. So since no. since the plants since the plants are hydrophytes, there's no, no there's no there's no fear of losing water to the environment. So they shouldn't have a waxy cuticle. So what what all those plants have is poor development of roots and xylem tissues. So I will explain why why this is the answer. The reason why they have poor roots development is, that is because they live in they live in what they live on in or on water. So they, their roots don't go deep down the, the water bed. So I will give you an example. For those of us who have, who have gone to, who have seen aquatic plants before, if you try to pluck them, it's really very easy to pluck because the, their roots are not really firm to the ground. So you can easily pluck them off the water body. So in that case, they have poor development of roots and xylem tissues because they live in water. So let's go to the next question we'll have here. That's number three. Which of the following use diffusion as the principal method of gaseous exchange? So we have grasshopper, we have rats, rats, we have lizard, and we have earthworm. Out of all these four, four um, examples or four options, we're going to look at organisms that use diffusion for respiration or gaseous exchange. One thing we need to note is that for any organism that will use Okay, so that will use the what's it called diffusion, then that organism should have a moist a moist body. Grasshoppers do not have or they don't have moist body surface. So even we can't see when, your screen again. We can't see your screen again, please. Okay, yes, we can see it now. Okay, fine. So the first option is grasshopper. The reason why that is not the answer is that grasshoppers do not have a moist skin. This, the body of the of grasshopper is what is is it has cuticle, so all over its body. So it does not use its body surface for respiration. Grasshoppers have their own what organs for respiration, so they can't use diffusion for respiration. Rats do not use that. The answer there is earthworm. Earthworms have moist body surface, so it's easy for gas to diffuse and enter their blood vessels. Do we understand? So what I mean here is that because earthworm, ha earthworms have moist body. For those of us who have touched earthworm before, the body is what their body is is moist. So in that case, it's easy for gas to diffuse into the body of earthworms. So that is why earthworm is the answer. Number four, the theory which supports the view that the large muscles developed by an athlete will be passed on to the offspring was proposed by who? There's this theory, when we go to evolution, who so, 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 so have learned that part of biology, evolution, we would see a lot of theories, theories by, by Mendel, by Darwin, by Lamarck. These are, these are what biologists who have talked about evolution and how man came to be. There's this theory that we, we, we learned that if you, if you happen to go to the gym, for example, you go to the gym and you now become very muscular because you because you because you have you've been gymming. That that um, trait of you being muscular cannot be passed to us, to your offspring because you acquired it through your through the environment. It's not embedded in your genes. Only those traits that are found in the genes can be passed to the what to the children or to your offsprings. What I mean is this: if a person goes to the gym and begins to walk to gym for a long time. Or observe that that person will become very muscular, and you see the person's um, um, what's called muscles coming out. That person developed that that trait because of what the environment, the kind of thing he did, and and so on. So that kind of trait is not found in the genes and cannot be passed to us to one's child. It is called what? Hello, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Yes, yes. Okay, fine. That theory is called the theory of use and disuse, and it was proposed by Lamarck, Jean Baptiste Lamarck. It was one that proposed the theory of use and disuse. So, the next one, the chromosomes of members of the kingdom Monera are within the words. The we have five kingdoms of classification. 
we have five kingdoms proposed by R. H. Whitaker. There are five kingdoms: Kingdom Monera, Kingdom Protista, Kingdom Fungi, Kingdom Plantae, and Kingdom Animalia. These are the five kingdoms that we we'll have. And one thing we should also notice that not all organisms are plants or animals. Some of them are not plants. Some of them are not animals. They are neither plants nor what nor animal. For example, bacteria is not a plant. At the same time, it's not an animal. So how do we classify bacteria? Bacteria is a member of kingdom. Minerals have a, a peculiarity. They have, and that is, they, are, they, are, they don't have a particular nucleus. The nucleus is not definite. They don't have a definite what, nucleus. In that case, the, the nuclear materials like the chromosomes and the likes are found within the cytoplasm. They are found within what within, within the cytoplasm. In that case, the answer to number five is cytoplasm. The chromosomes of monerans are found within what the cytoplasm. Number six is talking about biomes in the biomes in the world, the savanna and the, the tropical rainforest and the likes. So the mangrove swamp in Nigeria is found in what part? Did the Sahel savanna, the Guinea savanna, the tropical rainforest, or the Sudan savanna? Please, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Yes, we can see it. Fine. So savanna areas are grassland areas. For example, we said savanna, Sahel savanna, Guinea savanna, and Sudan savanna. All those savanna regions are, are what places where we can only find we can only find what grasses. We only have few and short trees at those regions. When you go to the west, go to Ogun State, go to Ekiti, you have, you have more of more of tall trees. So those regions are not savanna regions. But the regions where you can where you find predominantly grasses, where you don't see trees, are called savanna areas. So are those those regions don't have they don't have swamps. So the region where you can find mangrove swamp is what is the tropical rain forest. You can find it in the in the southwestern part of Nigeria. So so the answer to that question is tropical rainforest. We'll go to number seven. The pancreas secretes enzymes for digestion of what and what substrates. We have a lot of substrates in these options. Food substrates. We have fats, we have proteins, carbohydrates, we have vitamins, cellulose. So which of them is digested by pancreas? Pancreas is found within the, within the abdomen, close to the stomach. And it's a very vital organ for digestion. What does it do? It has some enzymes that it releases to the world, to the intestine for food digestion. But when food gets to the stomach, it goes straight to the, to the, to the small intestine, the duodenum part of it. But when it gets there, the food is awaiting digestion. So the pancreas will now release pancreatic juice. The pancreatic juice is not a normal juice that we we'll buy or we we'll drink. It's an enzymatic juice. It's juice that has enzymes. So the enzymes in the, pan, in the, pancre, in the pancreatic juice are Lipids and, and what? And amylase. Trypsin, we have lipids and we have amylase. We call it LATS. The, the acronym is LATS. L A C. LATS. L for lipids, A for amylase, and T for trypsin. So these three enzymes are found in the pancreatic juice. And what they do is to digest what? Digest lipids. Lipids will, di will digest fats. Amylase will digest carbohydrates and trypsin would, di would digest proteins. So the answer is fats, protein, and carbohydrates. Option A is the answer. Fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Fat is broken down by lipids, protein by trypsin, and carbohydrates by amylase. These three enzymes are found in the pancreatic juice produced by the pancreas. So let's go quickly to number eight. The causative agent of bed flu is a what? Bed flu is a it's a disease that, that kills birds. There was a time we had it in, in Nigeria and it killed a lot of um, birds. So we have protozoans, we have virus, we have bacterium and we have fungus. So one thing I wanted to notice, I want us to notice that whenever we, we hear of flu, flu is usually a viral disease. Flus, any form of flu is a, is a viral disease. So the causative agent of bird flu is a virus. 
we'll go to the next one. Number nine, the water medium is necessary for fertilization in which of these options? Water medium is necessary for fertilization in which of these? Conifers, angiosperms, pens, or fungi? The answer to this question is what is pens. Pens are non-flowering plants. So in that case, they need water for fertilization. We'll go to the next one. An example of a sex-linked trait is what? An example of a sex-linked trait. Before I begin to call the options, I would like to explain what sex-linked trait means. When they say a trait is linked to a particular sex, it means that it is linked to a particular gender. I'll give you instances. We have seen a lot of persons who, who don't have hair at the front of their head. That's baldness. We call it aquari in Yoruba. Those who don't have hair at the front of their head. Baldness. Baldness is found in is found mostly in males. You rarely see a female, a, a bald female. In fact, when you see people, when you see like 100 persons, you might only find one or you don't even see a bald female among them. So it's rare, it's rare to see what a bald female. So baldness is a trait. And it's only it's mostly found what in males. So it is a sex linked trait linked to what the male gender. I'll give you I'll give us another instance. Color blindness. Not being able to see a particular color is also linked to what? To males. We find it more in males than what? Than females. So that's what we mean by sex linked traits. Those traits that we find in a particular gender more than the other one. So they are called sex linked traits. So we have color of the skin, we have ability to roll the tongue, possession of facial hair and ability to grow long hair in females out of this option which one which of them is linked to a particular gender the color of this of the skin is the same for all gender we, we have fair males and fair females dark males and dark so it's not it's not for it's not gender based the other one is rolling the tongue rolling the tongue can be done by both males and females it doesn't have to do with a particular gender so that's not the answer but this the c part is saying facial hairs in, in adult humans we all know that we have, we have more, we have a lot of males that have what, that have beards, beards and facial, well, and facial, even mustaches, beards, beards and what, and facial, it's found, more, it's found in males. Only few or very rare females have what, facial hair. So the D option is saying growing long hair. Growing long hair doesn't have to do with the gender. If males also keep their hair, there's a high tendency that what, they also have very long hair if males keep their hair. So the answer to this question is what, option C, possession of facial hair in adult humans, because we find that mostly in males, it's, it's peculiar to a particular gender. So it is called a sex-linked trait. So I'll be going to the next um, question, but I want to know if you are still following before I go on. Hello? So I can hear you. you. Can you continue, please? Right, number 11 is saying, in which of the following Nigerian states can mountain vegetation be found? Mountain vegetation. Mountain vegetation is found mostly in those regions that have hills, that have valleys, that have mountains and the like. So we have those, mountain, those vegetation in those regions. So we have Bauchi states, Plateau states, Taraba and Enugu. Out of these states, which of them is which of them has mountains, valleys, and um, hills? And based on what we've seen, and for those of us who have been to the northern part of Nigeria before, we will, we will not we will observe that Plateau State has a lot of hills and mountains. So in that case, we have more of mountain vegetation in what in Plateau States. So the answer is Plateau, option B. So let's go to the number number twelve question. Which of the following is true of cloning? Which one is true of cloning? When a person is cloned or when a, a, a living thing is cloned, what does it really mean? It means reproducing a particular organism, producing a, a, a new one from an old one. For example, making a, a human being from another human or making a, a dog from another dog. There was this um, re, um, report of a successful cloning in, in the world. There was a scientist that actually cloned a sheep. So a sheep was cloned he extracted, the person extracted a particular cell from a sheep, the animal sheep now. After extracting it, he now did some, some experiment and some things on it, and he was able to make another sheep. The name of the sheep is, um, was Dolly. Dolly the sheep was the first case of cloning in the world. So 
cloning has to do with making a new offspring with with what the cells of what of an old one such that both of them now look so much alike so the answer is well the options we have is it is welcome as an ethical and normal sound science that is wrong it is not ethical and it has been it has been abrogated it's no longer acceptable number two it involves the asexual multiplication of tissues of the original organism okay the clone is similar to, but not exactly like the original organism. Only one cell of the original organism is needed to imitate the process. The answer is option D. Only one cell of the original organism is required to imitate the process. So we'll go to the next one. 13. The process of shedding the exoskeleton of an arthropod is known as what? A. Ecdysis. B. Insta formation. C, metamorphosis, and D, osmosis. So this is a very interesting question. Shedding and exoskeleton. I will want to explain shedding of skeleton first before going to the, to the answer. Animals that have, animals that don't, that don't have backbones, like the insects, they don't have backbones, but they have skeleton. Their skeleton is called an, an exoskeleton. Because, because it's an exoskeleton, it is not made of what? A living material, but chitin. Chitin is the material that makes what? The exoskeleton of arthropods. What I'm seeing in essence is that arthropods, like insects, have a skeleton. But their skeleton is not a bony type. It's not bony. It is what? The chitinous exoskeleton. Chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N, makes up their exoskeleton. But it does not grow, it does not increase in size. So when the animal is growing, it does not permit the animal to grow in size because it, well, it's not growing with the animal. Like it is outside the animal, but it's not permitting growth of the animal. For example, if when you wear a shirt now and you grow and you grow fat, and you, you want to now put on that shirt again after growing fat, it will be, it will be very what, uncomfortable because you are now bigger than the shirt. So the shirt will, 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 will eventually will tear off your body because you are now bigger than the shirt. That's what happens in the case of of arthropods, when they begin to grow, insects begin to grow, the skeleton does not is not able to accommodate the new size of the animal, so it has to go, it has to be removed. So that's what we call shedding of the skeleton. It has to be what they have to remove the, the outer covering, so to permit growth of the animal. So for those of us who have seen cockroaches before, we will we'll see we've seen a white cockroach before. So it's because the cockroach is trying to is trying to get bigger or grow bigger, it has to remove the outer covering, the brown covering. So that he now, well, he now gets a new skin. So the, that process is called ecdysis. It has two names, actually. We can call it molting, M-O-U-L-T-I-N-G. Or we can call it ecdysis. It has to do with removal of the exoskeleton to permit growth of the animal. So we'll go to number 14. Which of the following is a major cause of constipation in humans? What is constipation? It has to do with inability to or difficulty in passing out or passing out one's excreta. When you go to the toilet and you are you, trying to, you are, you are constipated. You're not, you're not able to, or to to pass out the, your your excreta. It's called the, it's called constipation. So what are, what is that um, the major cause of constipation? Number one, we have A says lack of roughages. B says vitamin B, C vitamin E, and D lack of salt. What causes constipation is lack of roughages. When you don't have much of it in your diet, you've eaten, taking breakfast, you've taken lunch, you've taken dinner with little or no roughages. Now, how do we get what are roughages? What are those food substrates that give us roughages? We have predominantly vegetables. So fruits and vegetables are what? They are the major substances or food so, so substrates that will give us what roughages. So Whenever we eat, we should take more of roughages, take more of vegetables. You eat rice with vegetable soup. You take um, your lunch, take take fruits after after taking um, or other food so that you can can have enough roughages in your body system. So when you go to the toilet, you can easily what pass out your your feces without any itch. So that the answer is lack of roughages. Number fifteen, in mammals, the organ directly on top of the kidney is the what? Mammals have kidneys, and kidneys are for excretion. Kidneys excrete, well, excrete nitrogenous waste in the form of urea, 
in the case of human beings, human beings excrete urine, but that urine is what is urea plus water. So if if you if you are asked, what is the main, what is the the excretory product of of uh, what's it called produced by the kidney? The answer is urea, not urine, because when you, urine is what is is a combination of urine, urea rather, urea and water. So, but the main substance there is urea. So kidney, there's an organ on top of kidney. What is it called? It is called the adrenal gland. Ad, the word ad means what? On top. Renal means kidney. So adrenal gland means on top of the kidney because renal itself is kidney. So there are two names. You can either call it kidney or the renal organ. So the renal means kidney. So adrenal on top of the kidney. That, so the answer is option A. We'll go to number 16. An accurate identification of a rapist can be carried out by conducting what tests? You want to identify somebody has been raped and you want to know who did that. So what you have to do, is it RNA analysis? Is it blood group tests, behavioral te tree test, or DNA analysis? What we have to do is simple. The person who has been raped has to be examined. The semen sample of the rapist will be what we'll be taking. And we we'll now go for DNA analysis. But if that if that analysis if it, if it matches that of a suspect, then the suspect is what is the rapist. That is how to get the, the, the identify the, the rapist DNA analysis. We'll go to number seventeen. An example of a fish that estivates. Estivation has to do with going down going down the soil. You know when you go to the aquatic environment, you see a lot of interesting things. Some fishes, what they do is to go down the the the, the, the river bed, they go into the mud. So you have to you have to have you need to go down to also what to um get them. So we have croaker fish, we have long fish, shark and catfish. The answer of, of a fish, the answer is what is number is option B, long fish. It estivates. Number 18, the opening and closing of the stomach of the stomach are regulated by what? Opening and closing of stoma are regulated by what? We have the stoma. We have stomata and lengthy cells in the in the in the body of a uh, plant. Stomata and lengthy cells are used for gaseous exchange. The way human beings have lungs for respiration or for gaseous exchange, other organisms have different organs for for respiration. So in the case of plants, what they have is stomata and lengthy cells. Stomata is found on the on the leaves, while lentil cells are found on the stem, on the stem of the plants. So the, the opening and closing of the stomata and lentil cells is, is, is what? Regulated by which of them? Is it respiration, osmosis, diffusion, or transpiration? The answer is, is what is diffusion. Diffusion regulates the opening and closing of the stoma. We'll go to number 19. Which of the following is, which of the following is common to the mosquito, house fly, and black fly? Mosquito, housefly, and blackfly. One interesting thing about this, this species we have here is that they are all insects. Mosquito is an insect, housefly is an insect. At the same time, blackfly is also an insect. In fact, anything fly is an insect. So far, it is, so far it is a fly, then it's an insect. Another thing we can use to identify flies is that flies have six, six walking legs. Six walking legs. Like in the case of spiders, spider is, spider is not an insect because it, it doesn't have what? six legs spiders have more than six legs they have eight legs so we don't classify spiders as as insects but those those arthropods that have six legs are called or they are called insects so we have mosquitoes we have house flies and we have black fly so what is that thing that is common to the three of them are they parasite of man mosquito is not a parasite of man and, and so and so does the other the other the other two their yeah, immature stages are aquatic. They undergo complete metamorphosis. Their adults have two pairs of wings. The answer to this question is option C. The three of them undergo complete metamorphosis. What does it mean, complete metamorphosis? That is, they grow from egg to larva, larva to pupa, and pupa to adult. That's the stage of growth in those insects. In some other insects, we might not have such um, such um, arrangements. For example, cockroaches don't have pupa stage; they don't have larva stage. They only go from from egg to nymph. 
cockroaches grow from egg to nymph stage and from nymph to what to an adult. But in the case of mosquitoes, housefly, and blackfly, the three of them undergo the egg, larva, pupa, and adult stages. So that's why they are they are alike in that in that what in that regard. Number twenty. The organ that that will be most useful to giant African rats in finding their way in underground habits, habitats are what? The giant African rats. What organ is most important to them when it has to do with finding their way in underground habitats? You know, we all know that rats find, they, there's a way they do, um, what's it called? They, they, they bore holes to create what pathways for them to move. Those of us who have read, who have rats around our vicinity would have observed that. So do they use their nostrils for that or the eyes, the vibrissae or their tails? The organ used by rats, by African rats, is the, the vibrissae. What are vibrissae? They are those facial hairs, those whiskers around the mouth. So they are actually used for, for finding their way in underground tunnels. So we'll go to the next one. A crucible of five grams weight. A crucible of five grams weighed 10 grams after filling with fresh soil. It is then heated in an oven at 1000 Celsius for one hour. After cooling in a desiccator, the weight was eight grams. The percentage of water in the soil is what? This is a, this is a very simple question. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's also an indication that we also have mathematics in, in biology. So for us to be strong in biology, we also have to be what? Have a good foundation in mathematics. So the, because all the scientists are what they are interwoven, they go pari passu. So this is asking us that the five grams weight of the crucible, that was the original weight of the crucible. So when the first was now added to the crucible, it was now weighed again. Then it became 10 grams. What this means is that the soil that was added to it is what is five grams. Since the crucible had five words, five grams weight before. And then after the soil has been added to it, it now became 10. It means that that soil has what? A mass of five grams. I believe you understand that. Then after heating the, what, the, 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 the crucible in an oven, we now had to weigh the, what, the crucible again. And we now had to, we now saw that the weight came down to eight grams means that the crucible has lost two grams. So what is the percentage of water in the soil? One thing we should note here is that after, we, after heating the crucible, the water in the soil will, will evaporate. So when it evaporates, the soil will now become, will now become dry. So the number, the, how many grams of water do, uh, have been lost? We do what? 10, 10 grams minus eight grams. That's two grams of what? Salt have been lost. So how do we get the percentage of water? We we'll do two grams, two grams over five grams, not ten, because the soil was for, the weight of the soil is five grams. So after after the heating process, the weight of the soil became what became thirty grams. So we we'll do two grams over five grams, and that will give us zero point four. That's the percentage of water in the soil. I believe we will understand that. So we'll go to the next question twenty two. The waste product of plants used in the conversion of hides to leather is what? Just like human beings have waste products, we have sweat as a waste product, we have urea as a waste product, we have salts as well. So plants also have their own waste products. They have alkaloids, they have resins, tannins, and gums. Please, let's note the, the, the option is gum, not gum. G U M, that's the right spelling. So those four are waste products of the plants, but not all of them are used for conversion of hide to leather. Hide is what? Is the skin of animals. The skin we get from animals is called hide. So that hide is used to what? To make leather. Our leather shoes, leather bags are gotten from the, the skin of animals called hide. It's called what? Hide. So how do we convert the hide to make leather? We, have, we need to add some chemicals. So the one we use for conversion of hides to chemicals to leather is called tannin. Tannin is used for to convert hide to leather. So that's the answer to that question. 23, the correct sequence of movements of urea during during what? Urine formation is what? 
the correct movement of urea is what? You know, we have this is this is a topic on excretory system and the kidney to be precise. We have the the, the main function, the functional part of the kidney that does the excretion is called the, the urinary tubule or nephron. So in the nephron, we have the Bowman's capsule, we have the convoluted tubule, we have the loop of Henle, and we have the collecting ducts or collecting tubule. So these are the parts of what's a nephron. And the nephron is the main part of the kidney that does the excretory function. So what is the sequence of movement of urea? How does urea get removed from the, from the body? From what region to what region and to what region? So we need to note the sequence. So the answer is, is option A, from, from the glomerulus, which is the mass of blood capillaries, it goes to the Bowman's capsule. Then from there, it moves to the convoluted tubule. It goes to the Henley's loop. And from there, it goes to the collecting tubule. And from there, it goes out of the body. We'll go to the next question, 24. In lizards, the, lo the, the lowing of the gular fold is used to what? The gular fold of lizard is that part around the jaw of the animal. If you look at the, the, the jaw, just down the mouth of the animal, you find something that is that is protruded a little bit down. That's called the gular fold. So what does it do? What does the gular fold do in the, in the body of in, in lizards? Please, before I go, I want to I want to ensure that we are still following. Are we still here? Hello? Hello, is it, uh, it seems uh, Miriam has a question. Can you go on? Okay, fine. You still have a question, Miriam? I think I should continue. Yeah, I think maybe uh, and uh, mistakenly push the raise and button. Okay, please can you still see my screen? Yes. Fine. The, the gola fold is that part just uh, behind the jaw of lizards. So what does it use? What what is that part used for? A defend their territory. B attract mates. C frighten enemies. And D catch insects. One thing we should note is that lizards are domineering. They, 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 they observe what we call tem, uh, tem territorial behavior uh, ferociously. They defend their territory ferociously. They, they only, what they do is that they, they mark out territories and they say, this, is, this region is for me. Don't cross this boundary. What, they, they only allow young, young lizards to, cross it, to enter their territory. At the same time, they also allow us female lizards to enter, but they fight the male ones just to gain just to gain dominance over their territory. So when a male lizard comes to comes to close to their territory, they begin to they begin to fight. They engage in a very ferocious fight. So and you see that the gola food is now what is now extended downwards. That's a lowing. It goes down the animal. So it is it's a way of frightening the enemies, of frightening enemies. So the answer to that question is. Option C, frightening, frightening enemies is the answer. We'll go to 25. The photosynthetic pigments include what? Photosynthetic pigments. What are photosynthetic pigments? These are pigments that we we'll use in photosynthesis, those that are involved in photosynthesis. We know it is not only chlorophyll. Most plants are green. Most plants have color of green, but it is not only green that, that all plants. All plants have they have yellow colors, some have red colors, some have even blue colors. So those 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 plants that have other colors, do they have chlorophyll? The, the answer is this: they, they have chlorophyll, but they have other photosynthetic pigments. They are other words, photosynthetic pigments. We don't only have chlorophyll as that pigment. So the answer to this question is chlorophyll and carotenoids. Carotenoids also have what they are pigments that are involved in photosynthesis. 
but they are not green. Yeah, so chlorophyll is green and carotenoids have what other colors. So we'll go to the next one. The highest level of ecological organization is what? The highest level of ecological organization is what? Is it the ecosystem, the niche, the biosphere or population? So what we'll do is that we'll do a quick, a quick analysis of these options. A niche, or we can call it an ecological niche, it is something we, find, we can find in a population. A population is, is a, it has to do with the num total number of organisms of the same type in a particular habitat. For example, a collection of, of tilapia fish, because they have the same species, it's called the population. We can also have population of goats in a particular area, that's the population. So we can find niche in a population. Now, what is niche? Niche has to do with a particular role an organism plays in its environment. The role it plays, is it a consumer? Is it a producer? Is it, and, and that's, that's, that, and, and so on and so forth. So we also have among the options, we have biosphere, we have the ecosystem. So the answer here is the ecosystem, is the highest level of organization because the ecosystem has biotic and abiotic what, factors. Biotic means what, the living factors, abiotic what, the non-living factors. So under the biotic, we have the biosphere. The biosphere is that part that's what, that contains life. So it is a subset of the ecosystem. So the ecosystem covers all of them. Under the ecosystem, we have the what, the biotic and abiotic, where we have what, the biosphere. Under biosphere, we have population. And under the population, we have a niche. So the biggest one here is the ecosystem. We'll go quickly to the next one. The abiotic factor, abiotic factor which affects the distribution and abundance of organisms in a terrestrial habitat is what? Abiotic factor, that is non-living factors. Abiotic means what? Non-living. There's a space in that, um, in that number 27. It's not, it's a, it should be a mistake. It's supposed to be abiotic, not abiotic. So the A and the B are supposed to be together. So abiotic factors which affect the distribution of uh, an abundance of organisms in a terrestrial habitat is what? pH, we have competition, we have temperature, and we have light. The answer to this question is what is temperature? Temperature affects distribution of what? Of, of organisms in a terrestrial what, ecosystem. We have it, for example, if, you, if a place is if, if, when, we're, when we're on the place is so hot, we'll have some organisms that will, that will find in, in those regions. At the same time, if we have in a cold environment, we also have what, organisms who are, that are suitable for that particular environment. So temperature affects how many organisms we have. That's the abundance. It also affects the, the, the distribution. How are they? Are they sparse? Are they many? Are they, are they scanty? So that distribution has to do with what? The temperature of that environment. And the abundance is also what? Determined by the temperature of the terrestrial ecosystem. So we'll go to number 28. The eye defect that, that arises because the cornea is not curved smoothly. The cornea is not curved smoothly. We have astigmatism, short-sightedness, long-sightedness, and we have presbyopia. Which of this is the answer to our question? So looking at this, since they said the, the cornea is not curved, smoothly the answer is astigmatism astigmatism occurs when the, the the eye is not able to adjust the focal length of its lens to focus on near and distant objects it's not able to alter the focal length so you can't see both near and far objects so that is astigmatism it's caused by the the non-curve non-smooth non curve nature of what of the cornea we'll go to the, the next one number 29 which of the following is an example of parasitism? Which of the following is an example of parasitism? There are a lot, there are about three or four feeding relationships that we have. We have parasitism, we have mutualism, we have commensalism, we also have amensalism. But in this case, we are talking about parasitism. It has to do with two organisms, and one of them, one of them hosting the other one, and the other one is killing what killing its its host for example you accommodate somebody in your house the person is eating your food the person is sitting using your your resources and the person is trying to planning to kill you again that's parasitism 
I'll give us another example that, that is close to us. The the lice in our in our in, in the hair. Some people have lice in their in their head. So that lice is a parasite. It will feed on the on the host blood. It feeds on the on the blood of the host. It's also what causes irritation to the to the to the, to the, to the host body. Even the, the case of dogs, you know, some dogs have ticks on their body. They have ticks. So those ticks will be will, will suck the blood of the of the of dogs at the same time cause irritation. And if care is not taken, eventually they will they kill the dog. So those are parasites. All the things that what they feed on their host, feed, live on their host, and eventually what kill the host if care is not taken. So we we'll have option A, squirrel living in an abandoned nest of a bed. Since the squirrel is living in an abandoned nest, there's no bed or in the nest. The nest is abandoned. So it is not a parasitism relationship. So we have mistletoe growing on an orange tree, fungi growing on a dead tree branch. Since the fungi is growing on a dead tree, that is what that is that is what we call saprophytism. Well, we have cattle regrets taking taking what ticks. That is not tax, it's ticks, ticks from the body of cattle. Cattle egrets, those white beds that we'll find on, on for those who have gone to places where we have um, cattle, where the red cattle, you'll see those white beds on, on cows, on bulls. So those, those beds are called cattle egrets. What they do is to feed on the ticks on the body of the, of the cattle. So they're actually helping the cattle to remove the ticks on its body. So that is not detrimental to the host, it's beneficial. So it is not called parasitism. So the answer to the question is, is what option B, mistletoe growing on an orange tree. Mistletoe is a parasite. It derives nutrients from other plants. So in, the, in that case, it could what endanger the plant if care is not taken. So the answer is what, option B. We'll go to the next one. Number 30, the increasing order of the particle size in the following soil. Which one, which one is, the, is the best order? of increasing order of particle size. We have clay to sand, we have clay to silt to sand and to gravel. We have silt to clay, to sand and to gravel. We have clay to sand and to silt, then to gravel. The answer to this question is clay. Clay is, is fine, is fine what? Fine soil. The soil, the soil is what fine. What does also have touch clay soil? We we'll observe that clay soil is what is fine. It's like powder. You can even use that as a powder on our face. If you don't have powder at, at, um, in, in your house and you want to go out and you need to rub the powder, jokingly, you can use what? <laughs> you can use clay because it's fine. So, so we have clay to so silt. Then from silt to sand, gravel is the, big, is the biggest of all of them. So the answer is option B. So 31st, that's number 31. Which of the following factors? can bring about competition in a population. What can cause competition? What can cause organisms to begin to, begin to, work, to fight or struggle among themselves? Is it emigration? Is it drought, mortality, or dispersion? One thing we should know is that before organisms will begin to compete, it means that the resources that, that they have is limited, it's not enough. If, all, if everybody has enough resources, they will not compete. They will not struggle. So what brings about competition is what is limited resources. When resources are not, they are not enough. They are not in abundance. They begin to struggle for for resources. So the answer here is drought. Drought is a region is a, is a is a period of little or no rainfall. You know, when there is no rainfall, there won't be vegetation. So when there is no vegetation, what happens? Organisms begin to struggle among themselves for what? For the remaining ones. So the answer is what is drought. 32 is talking about stunted growth. Stunted growth and poor root development are a result of deficiency in what? We have phosphorus, we have calcium, we have sulfur, and we have iron. Which of this is caused by, by which, of this, which, of them, which of them causes was stunted growth? The answer is phosphorus. Phosphorus is a macro nutrient. It's a very important nutrient in plants. The macro elements, which is needed in high amounts by, by plants. So the answer is phosphorus. The next one is number 33. Let's use this diagram to answer the questions that follow. The diagram we have is that of a, of a plant cell. We can, looking at it, it has, it has a cell wall, it has a cell membrane, it has a cytoplasm. So this is a typical plant cell. So 
look at the diagram again. The cell organelle solely responsible for respiration is what? For respiration, we have the nucleus, we have the nucleolus, we have endoplasmic reticulum, and we have mitochondrion. So the answer here is what is mitochondrion. Why? Mitochondrion is the powerhouse of the cell. It is that part where we have cellular respiration. It is the part where energy is stored as ATP. So because of that feature, it is used as what as the respiratory what part of the of the plant cell. So 34, the organelle responsible for heredity is what? Heredity has to do with what? With inheritance of traits from parents to offsprings. So we have the nucleus as the principal organ for heredity in, 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 in the cell. So let's look at this um, diagram again. Which of them points at the nucleus? We have Romafigo I, 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 three and four. So which one is the answer? Based on what I'm seeing here, the answer to the question is option is I, I, I. And that is the, that the nucleus of um, the cell. I think we'll stop here because it's past one. Or should I still continue? Hello? Should we take questions now? Hello, can anybody hear me? Yes, we can. So should we take questions or we should go as you continue? Yeah, we have uh, like five minutes more. Okay, for the clock. Okay. So we'll, yeah. we'll go to the next question. And that's number 13. That's number 35. Let's look, let's, looking at this diagram, we'll have another diagram here. The process illustrated here is what? Gametogenesis, sexual reproduction in, in rhizopods, sexual reproduction in spirogyra, and option this is sporulation. The diagram we have here is that of um, rhizopods. Rhizopods nigricans, that's bread mold. The, that organism that grows on stale bread is called rhizopods. And what it does is it consumes the bread. It, it consumes the bread and one later was later decomposes it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's called a, a decomposer. So the answer is option B, sexual reproduction in, in rhizopods. We have two of them coming together to form what, to form a new to form a new what, a new species. So that's that. Number 36 is saying the structure labeled I, that's Romafigo I, is called what? We have zygospore. We have conidiosphore, we have sporangium, and we have hypha. The Romafigo high in the diagram is zygospore. It's zygo, zygospore. We'll go to the next one. Use the diagram below to answer question 37 and 38. Looking at this diagram, is this is a diagram of a unicellular organism. We have many of them, but this one is that of what? Of paramecium. Paramecium is is a unicellular organism that has a structure of the slippers. The slipper we will, will, will put on. So it is called a slipper animacle because it, it looks like what? Like a slipper. So when we get when we see something like this, we know this shape is that is that of a slippers. That's a quick way of remembering that this is what this is paramecium. And it only has one cell. It is a member of kingdom protista. The protist. So let's answer the question we have under it. The organelle responsible for sexual reproduction is what? Roman figure I, V, I, 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 and I, I, I. Which one is the answer? For sexual reproduction, we will look at what? We think about the nucleus. The nucleus being what? Responsible for sexual reproduction. So based on this diagram, we'll go for what? I, I, I. The next one is saying the path labeled IV is responsible for what? IV is towards the, the posterior part of the animal, the posterior part. Looking at it in the diagram, it's close to the posterior part. And based on the shape of IV, we'll know it is what is, it is the contractile vacuole. The contractile vacuole. And what it does is for, is what is to remove waste and excess water in the animal. So we call it osmoregulation. It maintains the source and water balance in the animal. Osmo regulation, maintaining, maintaining what the salt and water balance. And, for, and because of that particular organelle, 
the organism does not does not burst. You know, paramecium lives in an aquatic environment. So water enters the cell via osmosis. So the animal has, has a big water energy to grow big. It has a high chance of growing very big because the water enters its body. So the animal is supposed to grow very big and eventually burst. So to, pre to prevent bursting, it has a contractor vacuum that expels the excess water that enters the animal. So that's why they're able to stay very long in, in, the, in the aquatic environment before they, they eventually what die. But the main thing here is that the contractor vacuum is a very important organ in the body of, of um, protists, helping them to remove excess waste, excess water, and that's what we call osmoregulation. We'll go to number 39. Number 39 is a diagram of what? Of the mammalian heart. Use the following below. This is the diagram below to answer question 39 and 14. Looking at this diagram, this is what the mammalian heart. It has four chambers. You know, the, the, the mammalian heart has four chambers. The two top chambers are called the auricles, while the bottom chambers are called the ventricles. So we have the left auricle and right auricle left ventricle and right ventricle so let's go on the part labeled i is the words we have the pulmonary artery by by cuspid valve aorta and we have the vena cava so the answer to the question is what is the pulmonary artery looking at that diagram the, the graphical eye is pointing to a, an artery that carries blood away from the heart pulmonary artery is that artery that carries blood from the heart to the lungs for oxygenation the, the, blood, the blood that goes around the body has to be what? Has to be oxygenated. So it means that blood in the heart has to go to the lungs to, to receive oxygen. Then it goes back to the heart. From there, it becomes, it becomes what? It becomes pumped to the general body. The cells in the body require oxygen for, what? for survival. For us to live, our cells must get oxygen. So how do they get the oxygen? It means that we need to what? be able to pass the oxygen to them, one after the other. So who, what would what would do that kind of work for us? We have our blood. The blood system does the job. So what does it do? The blood in the heart moves from the heart to the to the lungs for oxygenation. It moves through a particular blood vessel called the pulmonary artery. So the artery carries it down to the to the lungs for oxygen uptake. Then it returns back to the heart again. Then from there it goes to the what to the body circulation. So the answer is pulmonary artery. For what? For oxygenation. We we'll go to the next one, number 14. Oxygenated blood is pumped to the entire body from the part labeled what? What part? What part of the uh, of the heart is the blood pumped to the to the body for circulation? Is it the the part labeled IV, the part labeled I, the part labeled II or III? The answer is what? The answer is I I. When the blood gets to the lungs, it returns to the other part of the of the what of the heart. I need to note, state this clearly. The the right part of the heart has blood without oxygen, while the left part of the heart has blood that has oxygen. We call it oxygenated blood. It's found at the left part of the heart. So when blood goes to the lungs for oxygenation, it returns to the what to the left part, because the blood at the right and the left do not mix. So the, 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 the only program such that when the blood is going, is moving from the lungs, after, the, after taking oxygen, it goes to the left part of the heart. Then from there, it is taken to the water, to the body for, to get to the, to, to, the, to the cells, because the cells need oxygen for survival. So that's what we call cellular respiration through blood pumping. So I think we should, um, we've we'll, we'll, we'll treated 40 questions today. We should entertain questions for now. If you have any questions, please, I would like to answer your questions. Yeah, over to you, Mr. Anishi. I think. Uh, I don't know if you have any question from the students. Okay. All right. I think maybe he's not uh, with his, uh, his phone. 
I thank you everyone for joining us again for this week. Learning is fun and particularly dedicated. Sorry, for I'm on transit. Sorry, I'm on transit. I'm driving presently. Yeah, no worries. No worries. You can, I, I will do the round up. No worries. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Uh, um, we hope that you've learned a lot from this session on Jam UTME questions breakdown and you've see how fast or easier way you can easily get the answers by following us and by following our instructors. So we thank our instructor, Mr. Sandman, for the exciting class for over one hour. And we hope you students have also learned a lot from the session. So we will be looking forward to welcoming you again next week for another session. And that will be on mathematics, hopefully, or chemistry. Otherwise, we say thank you for joining us and have a nice weekend. Bye, everyone. Yeah, do you have anything, Mr. Salman? Yes, I want to discuss privately with you. I think you should. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I also think of such when you raise your hands. All right, I think Mr. Anish is still. Uh, Mr. Anish, please, uh, I will remove you from the call now. Let me stop the streaming.